Welcome to episode six of Cross Ice Pass. I'm your coach, Steve Mosier. And I got to say, hockey's back, folks. This is the week. Um, I'm going to be recording on Friday the 13th of October, which is pretty rad um, because I'm going to be traveling back to hockey town. Um, so we're going to get things going. Um, some things leading into the season to note. Um, Hellepuck, Connor Hell, or, or, yes, Hellepuck is not going to the Canes and the Devils. I repeat, he's not going to the Canes and the Devils. Um, the Jets want to keep one of the top tenders in the league for possibly his entire career, being that he is 30 years old. So unless they want a giant trade. Michigan-born, Connor Hellebuck, born in Walled Lake, just next to next, next just next to where I grew, me and uh, and uh, Mr. Dylan Larkin grew up. So agreed to a seven year, eight and a half million dollar contract. Uh, Mark Shifley got the same contract. So the Jets um, didn't look like they were just decompressing and unloading to rebuild. So that's pretty good. I'm happy for for Hellebuck. I'm happy for Shifley because um, it seems like there's some movement going there to maybe a, a rebuild instead of a, you know, an improvement job. So Buffalo Sabres, Rasmus Dahlin gets P A I D paid 11 million for eight years, man. Then they sign Owen power for just over 8 million for four years. So, um, or for longer, I think, um, The Sabres are loaded. They're top four players in Cousins, uh, Tage Thompson, uh, Rosman Zanlin, and Owen Power are now set until um, after 2030. So, you know, they've got a good seven years of, uh, of, got a good seven years of that to deal with. Um, Sad news coming, um, leading up to our big uh, start of the season on Tuesday. Um, Barry Melrose, who everyone remembers, he's got, he's definitely an iconic character in not only in hockey, but in American, um, in U S hockey for the fact that he always had that slicked back, um, mullet, even when it was, it wasn't super, you know, cold unquote popular for the kids. Now it's back and hot and, and better than ever. But, um, the poor guy is fighting as has a fight with Parkinson's. Um, which means he's going to have to step away from uh, ESPN and uh, giving us his weird hot takes, his weird, um, you know, high takes, low takes, all the takes. Uh, Barry Melrose, um, he might not have been as uh, as out as outgoing and and odd as Don Cherry, but he definitely spoke his mind, and we love him for that. Um, never forget his his. Uh, Great time as the coach of the great one in La La Land. So um, I wish the best to Barry Melrose and his family. And we're going to miss him um, in TV and radio. And hopefully, um, you know, all the best for him and his family. Um, Something that is kind of heating up. But I'm going to start with something else first. We're going to start on the season start because I want to talk about this uh, pride tape situation. Um, The first, for one thing, I want to talk about um, Nikita Kucherov. Kucherov got the first goal of the NHL, but at a game at 530 in the afternoon. NHL, why? Um, First off, Nashville and Tampa. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Nashville and Tampa are becoming big, big markets now. Um, Nashville's got a great arena right downtown. Tampa three times the Stanley Cup, so their fans are growing. But I don't know. Five thirty in the afternoon game, people gotta work, son. Like we just don't have the time for that. Um, even though I did have it on a little bit while I was working, um, I just don't understand why we're not doing the Leafs Habs. Bruins Habs, um, Leafs Habs, 
seeing how their first game went. Holy crap. Could you imagine that at 530 in the afternoon or 7 o'clock? So, anyway, um, that didn't really happen. Uh, Hawks versus Pens uh, shattered a previous record by 92% of viewership. 1.431 million viewers viewed that game. And, yes, it has a lot to do with – the thing I love about that just, just goes to show that people just really wanted to see Connor Bedard. I think a lot of people love Sidney Crosby, so I think that was a great mix. Um, you've got a top market in Chicago. You've got a pretty high-level market in Pittsburgh. So, you know, as much as people like to say the T- that ESPN's terrible, listen – Proof is in the pudding. It's in the numbers. So can't say too, too much about that. Uh, Vegas uh, got to – had a truly Vegas-type banner raising. Um, it was uh, just like when you go to a show in Vegas, whether it's Cirque du Soleil or not, um, they're always super extravagant, super loud, super amazing, super bright. Um, and my best – my favorite part about it and really seeing the brotherhood – in the Vegas locker room, in the Vegas lo- roster. Um, they all had their hands, their, they were wrapping their arms around each other, kind of uh, as the banner was raising, getting ready for another, another uh, you know, another run at it. So, you know, I'm, re- I'm really happy. I've always been happy with the, the growth of the game in Las Vegas. Um, the fans there are amazing. Go to, if you haven't been to a game in Vegas, you don't know what you're missing. You got to go, even if it's your team and Vegas might beat them. Doesn't matter. So, highly recommend that. Um, Bedard had his rookie run at, before the Penguins um, game, and he didn't have his bucket on. First off, the kid forgot his stick. We all saw that all, all over the media. Whatever. The kid's nervous. Every hockey player's nervous after not playing for months. So, I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, this wearing helmets for warmups. Now, me being a TBI survivor, a head injury advocate, a big per, a big person on high level helmets. Why do? What's the problem with these guys uh, making their decisions about wearing helmets or not before the game? I don't care if a guy doesn't wear a helmet in the game. These guys are high level skaters. They skate so many hours every day. So often through the month, they're not going to get, they're not going to get injured. Um, I know that there is equity that uh, owners have now into these players and that equity seems to be getting larger and larger, um, hopefully. And listen, I just think it's stupid. Um, Let the players choose this. Uh, This is all about self-expression. It's about fans being able to kind of see, you know, someone's great salad flown around on the ice and see what their face is, not underneath a helmet and a half shield. So um, we gotta we gotta be better there. Um, second game was Bedard got his goal against uh, the Bruins. Congratulations, Connor Bedard. Um, I still think he's kind of he's kind of all over the place. Which you know it's the early part of the season that happens for all levels of player in the NHL. Um, and I think he'll 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 ease into that and be the natural goal, goal scorer we know he's going to be. Um, but Brad Marchand, as much love him or hate the guy, that guy doesn't he's not going to like take it easy just because some rookie is there. You know, guy he tries to go over the uh, bench, gets on trying to get on the bench. Connor Bedard gets stuck, but then Connor Bedard just kind of like let him take advantage. You know of the situation. Listen, this kid has to stop giving respect to other players. I know it's his first or second game. I understand all of that. But listen, I would have put an elbow straight to that big schnoz of, of Marshawn if I'm not, if he's trying to get on the bench and I'm trying to move into a play. But that's Marshawn. That's what everyone wants on their team. Everyone wants a clone of Marshawn on, Mar, Marshawn on their team. If you say you don't, you are out of your mind. So everyone wants that guy. As I mentioned, the Toronto's Habs game was epic, unbelievable. You got Wi-Fi fighting Reeves right away, not knocking the net over these two huge, strong dudes. You got Tyler Bertuzzi losing his shit like he did when, we, when he was with the Red Wings. You got, you got the Habs, the back and forth scoring, Austin Matthews, hat trick. Oh my goodness! Like how good is this hockey? Um, 
you just can't you 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 can't you can't you can't script that that being the first game of the season. So I'm very excited to see the Maple Leafs for the versus the Habs um, a couple more times this year. Um, let's go into the elephant in the room because I think a lot of hockey media and everything are kind of talking about this. And next episode, episode seven, I actually have a conversation with the New York City Gay Hockey Association. Um, I've posted some, uh, po- posted some on social media, kind of giving a little taste of that. We talk about the pride jersey issue, um, but mostly I wanted to talk to them about their growth and, and how it's really helped other organizations in the LGBTQ plus hockey world. And um, it's just been so great to see it at the rink. They started kind of the New York, New York City Hockey Gay Hockey Association runs at the rink I coach at here in New York City. So um, it was really great to have a conversation with them. I don't I didn't really want to put the focus on this unbelievable situation that the NHL is doing. Um, this pride tape situation, this is the NHL going too far. I'm sorry. The NHL as an organization claims they have a very inclusive, very um, well-run and growing group that is behind these initiatives and these supporting initiatives. Yes, um, it is rooted in pride. It is they're using pride to kind of get it out of the to kind of like shake their hair out of the situation. Um, removing these things from players who support them is wild. This also takes away from hockey fights cancer, Black history, Indigenous, AAPI um, situations, all the stuff that we um, Chinese New Year. I mean, remember the Chinese New Year like jerseys this last year? The Vegas Golden Knights had one of the coolest jerseys I've ever seen. Um, this is unreal. So I'm going to use some quotes this time. I usually kind of just kind of go off on this stuff, but this is so rooted in the the psyche of our of our community of our sport, and I want to make sure that I'm I'm saying things in the correct way. Gary Bettman says I suggested that I would be. Appropriate for it would be appropriate for clubs not to change their jerseys and warmups because it's because it's become a distraction and it taking away from the fact that all of our clubs in some form or another host nights in honor of various groups or causes. It's a distraction. Are you absolutely kidding me? In reality, it has only affected a wildly small percentage of players who choose not to wear them due to their religious religion and beliefs and the players that they that were really vocal about the fact that they didn't want to wear pride jerseys one's a backup for the red wings right now and the others are literally on the back end of their career or possibly retired why are we worried about this handful of guys that are so um aggressively against um homosexuality or anything else for that matter just because they're 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 religious it's absolutely ridiculous um this also has some Russian players involved because in Russia, families might be affected at home because of Russian laws when it comes to homosexuality. I totally understand that, but my plan is this. If, if that's the case, then those players don't have to partake. Like, why is the NHL so worried about the uniform? The uniform. This isn't the, the, the NBA before the Michael Jordan shoe came out. This isn't like... Players should be able to be individualized and be supporters of the things that they that they have the ability, the celebrity, and the know-how to be supporting of. Um, I just don't get it. Uh, it, it like, and, I, and I'm not the only one. I know a lot of people, and I know a lot of media is in the is in the same boat that I am. Um, if Russian players are having an issue wearing the, the pride jersey, I totally understand. You want to make sure your family's safe, whether it's your belief or not. Of of uh, you know support, but just give the players the choice. It's not a big deal. If you know if the stall if the stall boys want to don't want to wear a pride jersey, they don't have to. Who cares? Does it matter? Is it really weird in a warm up to see three guys real floating around without the pride jersey, knowing that 
95% of the guys on the ice probably are big supporters of not only uh, the LGBTQ plus world, but fighting cancer, black history, indigenous, cult indigenous cultures, um, Chinese New Year, all this stuff. There's so many things that this doesn't do anything for. And in fact, it actually raises money for these organizations. It brings um, a different level of art, artistry to the jersey design. Um, as a graphic designer, I'm pretty vocal about that situation. But then on top of it, um, it's just even Connor McDavid, Jack Hughes, and Sidney Crosby are big supporters of the LGBTQ plus community. Connor McV McDavid, his quote was this. I've expressed disappointment in not being able to wear the various jerseys or the tapes, whether that's pride tape or pink tape. And then he says, is it something that I'd like to see back into place one day? Certainly. Sidney Crosby said, it's unfortunate those nights are good opportunities. It's unfortunate this is happening because those nights are good opportunities to show our support for different initiatives and organizations. We'll have to find other ways whether it be players or teams to be able to do that. Now, Connor McDavid and Sidney Crosby, anytime you see an NHLPA meeting, you know what's who's coming out of it? Sidney Crosby and Connor McDavid. These guys have say-so, they have pull, and I really hope that the union doesn't get, doesn't get sucked in to the, to the league um, and the issues that this is. I know a lot of friends of mine that I play hockey with, they're, they're going to be like, why are you talking so much about this? It's not that big of a deal. It's a massive deal, guys. It's a massive deal. This is taking away the support of people that we want to play our sport at all levels and who, who are of any color, any sex, any race, from anywhere. It has to be about inclusivity in our sport. If we don't have inclusivity, we have a real problem in hockey. And we'll go right back to being known, as, of course, as a very high-level, straight, white, male sport instead of, you know, something that can be a little more open to, to the future of our sport. Um, I, uh, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really annoying for me for the fact that um, – this doesn't, it doesn't cost anything for them to do this as far as, you know, they're selling these, they're auctioning off pride jerseys for $600 to $1,000. People love these things. People love this initiative. People want to be a part of it. Instead, what we're going to get, and this is exactly what's going to happen, we're going to go to a game on pride night. There's going to be a fold-up coffee table sitting in the concourse, and you're, that you're not going to approach because it's packed in the concourse and you want to get a hot dog and a beer and you're not going to be or, or be as informed as you normally would be. It's going to be absolutely ridiculous. This is a systemic issue of empathy on these initiatives by the NHL. Um, the policing of thought and beliefs that the NHL is doing here isn't helpful to the growth of the sport. We need to be ahead of other leagues because they are too buttoned up to be themselves. Um, more to come in the next week's episode where I chat with the board members of the NYCGHA, but this is unbelievable. Um, I kind of understand when the tape in a game has to be a white or black tape. That's for goaltending purposes. Um, and and that's why we removed the mirrored lens from Ovechkin um, because goaltenders couldn't see how the, how eyes are moving and stuff. I get that part of the game, but what's the problem with a player putting a little pride tape on their on their handle or on their stick or something? There's not a big deal. A lot of the strict sticks have holographic, shiny, rainbow-colored graphics anyway. What is the difference? with some tape that has a few different colors. So um, we'll talk more about that in episode seven because um, I can't wait for you guys to hear um, from the two board members that I spoke with. Um, moving on. I want to talk about my guest today. Now, I was going to wait this guest out to kind of be 
a moment of information for maybe parents, um, for maybe beer leaguers that are looking for new skates, but also a little history about something that's very interesting to me. Um, I'm a bit of a gearhead. Anybody you know, kind of, you know, I'll know what new sticks are out that year, what new skates are out that year. I follow all that information. So it's, uh, it's a big, it's, it's a bit something I'm very interested in. For years, for years, I've been wearing, um, I've been kind of on a, on a search for a pair of skates um, that really fit. And I finally found it with True, um, the True team that works so tirelessly to make the skates different and better is really great. So our guest today is going to be Tyler Duro. Um, he is one of the managers um, that works in the hockey skate part of True Hockey. He's also a national, nationally ranked um, Canadian speed skater who has um, who has retired, but he had one heck of a one heck of a speed skating career. We're going to talk about speed skating because I want to talk about I want to talk to him about the history of why we went from speed skate boots and speed skaters kind of updating their skates, hockey skaters over here updating their skates, and. Tyler tells us some really amazing, amazing things about certain NHL players um, that really were doing some wild things with their skates. And now we have the ability to do that because True has created these custom skates and they've been you bringing in the technology of, uh, of a speed skate. And speed, skate, speed, speed skating as a sport has been around since the 13th century, of course. Why would we never bring this in? And why has this not been talked about sooner? We're going to we're gonna move over to, t- to, to Tyler because he's going to mention some things that happened in the history of, of, uh, of hockey and speed skating. And we're going to talk a little bit of him about his career and his time um, with the Canadian national team and coaching as well. He's definitely got his hands in, in, in everything. He coaches youth hockey. He coaches speed skaters. He's a um, high-level uh, speed skater himself. Um, and he surprised me that he actually grew up playing ice hockey. Not super surprising that, that he's from Winnipeg. But here we go, uh, Tyler Duro. Well, we've got speed speed skater Canadian, for the Canadian national team from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Moved from short track to long track, um, trying to make the 2010 uh, Canadian Olympic team. That was that switch happened to the Olympics in Vancouver. He has coached a lot of elite level speed skaters. Works at True Temper Sports as their senior manager, hockey skate division. Um, a dad, a youth hockey coach for his daughter and his son. Um, here we here we go, Tyler Duro. Welcome to Cross Cross Ice Bass. Thanks, thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. For sure. No, um, I, I can't wait to like dig into all of the things that that True offers and some of the technology and the engineering of it, but. I usually kind of start every every uh, episode with, um, and I know you were a speed skater, but I know that there's some hockey in there. I mean, Winnipeg is um, it's kind of a, hard to avoid out there, I'd imagine. Absolutely. So I would I would love to know what your fondest hockey memory is. It oh. could be an old one, a new one, anything. Yeah, you know, I think that the memories I reflect you know, back on most, uh, of course in Winnipeg, there's, there's natural ice, you know, throughout December, January, February, stretching into March. So we're playing on the ODR all the time. I remember being, you know, 12 years old and, you know, at nighttime, it's dark at 5 PM in the middle of winter here. Right. So you get home from school, grab my stick, throw my skates on my stick and grab my helmet, hanging off, put it over my shoulder. And every night of the week, walking over the ODR, uh, looking to play just a pickup game, uh, you know, just play for two hours and not even think about it. And with everybody who was out there and I just remember that being so special and at the time, not realizing that, but when I reflect upon that, uh, was something that I just loved to do every night you're out on the ODR and you think you're winning the Stanley cup. And, and at that age, when you're, you know, you're 10 years old, you think you are going to win the Stanley cup. So, uh, yeah. You know, I really cherish that. And then just, you know, memories with my team and had a tight knit group growing up that I played with. Um, Yeah, it it was a lot of fun. And of course, I eventually made the permanent switch to to speed skating. I did both hockey and speed skating growing up until I was about 13. Um, 
but yeah, it was a, it was a great part of my life. And I just, yeah, I won't forget those, those nights, just walking to the rink down the street in the dark and lacing up and playing with, you know, just a bunch of strangers who become friends. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a real, real big part of my childhood. Yeah. And like, I grew up around lakes in Michigan and that whole, uh, that whole, that, 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 that ODR lifestyle was so big. And the only, the only way you could get away is like, if your mom, like came, your dad would, wouldn't care, but if yeah. mom came, you better, you got to get home. But if you run out of pucks or you just shoot pucks, you know, into the distance and try and you're like, Oh, I don't really want to go chase that one down. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, you know, it's interesting to know that you kind of went into speed skating as a teenager, but then, um, you know, looking through and kind of researching your career, you have so many tons of records in, in, in the province of Manitoba. And I'm even wondering, like, you know, just are some of those still, are, are people breaking them? Is the, is the development and the growth of speed skating in, in Manitoba kind of breaking those, uh, those old records away? Yeah, I, you know, I hold on to a few. I'm not sure how many, um, <laughs> but I think the one that I still hold would be the, still the senior record of, in the 1K, so the one kilometer race. So I'm still holding on to that one just barely, but I'm sure we got some great young skaters coming through uh, that are just, just, you know, fractions of a second away from getting it. So uh, I still hold on to a few. Um, and uh, yeah, proud of that. But uh, I'm sure soon enough they'll be gone. So <laughs> it's been, uh, you know, that's... it's been about 10 years now that I've hold, held that one. So. Wow. No, that's, it made me, it made me think about the comparison of, you know, the Wayne Gretzky goal record. And now this, like this close, you know, step-by-step, -step, um, you know, move that Ovechkin's making to maybe breaking that record. Um, so that's good to know, but also kind of knowing that, you know, after you kind of hung up the skates, I don't know if you were coaching speed skating while you were still competing or if it was more of kind of like a progression from competing to, to coaching. Yeah, it was, it was a progression. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that, you know, the journey in your life will go on. And at the time I was still competing on the national team. I was 28 years old and that was 10 years ago. And, uh, my wife was like, Hey, uh, I'm pregnant. I'm like, okay, you know, I got to, uh, kind of make sure <laughs> I get serious now and we'd be, I'm going to be raising and supporting a family. So throughout my skating career, i had been working with Scott Van Horn. i had been pursuing my education at the University of Calgary, and i had been, you know, competing on the national team and world championships. Um, so I really knew my expertise was skate making and coaching. And a few years prior to this, I had moved with Scott back to Winnipeg, helped him set up a factory in Winnipeg. And then I went back to Calgary to keep pursuing my speed skating dream while becoming sort of a traveling sales rep for Scott. So I would be at the World Cups, the World Championships, molding my competitors, fixing their skates, making adjustments, and then competing myself. And that's kind of how I, you know, helped support my career, uh, skating career, but also was building a little bit of my own, you know, future work, working career, not realizing at the time. So after finding out my wife was pregnant, there was a job opening in Manitoba for the provincial speed skating coach, kind of looking at my skill set. Uh, I'm like, okay, I understand skating, and, and, I, and I'd done my coaching courses. Uh, and then further to that, you know, talking with Scott, he's like, well, I want to get you back in the factory if you can come, because we always worked in the factory making the skates together for about uh, six years or you know eight years before that together always in the factory and then we we're kind of working apart for those next four years so it was like yeah come back in i got a spot for you so all of a sudden it's like i got a coaching job and i got a skate making job that i love and uh it was just sometimes the right things come together at the right time um and it was still the vh days of of uh the hockey business so it all it all came into place and yeah that's that's kind of how i worked my way Really quickly, I, I was at a national training camp, and about three weeks later, I was coaching the provincial speed skating team. So, wow! Quick, no, that's yeah. It seems like it all kind of in a very short lane, everything came together, which sounds pretty awesome. And I know you guys have been so successful at True, and I know that um, you were coaching um, Alexis Scott, who's uh, uh, from Winnipeg, right? And Correct. 
Um, are you still coaching her? I know that she, uh, she's been kind of uh, moving up the ranks and such. Yeah, no. So as a provincial coach, you, the, most of the skaters will skate with you until they graduate to the national team and then they have to move to a national training center. So she was training here with me. We, I think I coached her for about six years. Um, it was really fun to watch her climb the ranks from a, you know, just a young kind of junior skater all the way up to coaching her at junior worlds where she got uh, a bronze medal in the all around at the junior worlds, which is a big accomplishment. And then she moved uh, to Calgary and then about six months later, she made the Olympic team. So uh, it was pretty, pretty special to see her go do that and accomplish that goal. That's great. No, um, especially because I hear the le about the legendary Calgary Oval. So, and that's, that's like the, every Canadian sp speed skater is, you know, speed skating. I've watched it. I've seen it so many years in the Olympics and stuff, but kind of like digging into it, um, talking to, you know, to your folks when I, when I met your parents and kind of digging into it over the years, um, I've started to learn those little, those little things that, that maybe most Americans might not know about it. <laughs> um, it's interesting to know. Yeah. It's so interesting to know that like, um, you actually kind of drove right into the question I was going to ask about your relationship with Scott Van Horn and the fact that I've seen some videos and interviews you've had before about how the thing that I find very interesting from speed skating to, to hockey skates is how much molding and how much, how much the boot is important. I mean, of course the steel is important, but just the boot technology is so wildly different and it's pretty amazing to think about about that when it comes to I'm kind of curious about how you guys just were you were you guys just like doing this in an apartment or a little space and then just kind of built it up from there or how did that work? Yeah, uh, well, Scott, for starters, you know, um, he's a bit of an anomaly, right? He, he's not your average, you know, your average your average guy. He when you look at his story. Um, at 16 years old, at 14 years old, he was already taking his skates apart. He has very flat feet. He always had a lot of issues with his feet. And at 14, he was taking his skates apart because he was in so much pain skating uh, that he was trying to make them fit and feel better and more comfortable. Uh, and his dad was a doctor, so he had some access to different uh, materials like fiberglass and, and things like that that he could help reconstruct his skates with. So things that you would have been making a cast with, he was using to restructure his boots and make them stiffer and more supportive, you know, at 14 and 15, which if, you know, most 14 and 15 year olds aren't even thinking about that, right? You know, by 16, he was tearing the skates apart fully and rebuilding them. So he was really gaining an understanding to how to make a skate. Uh, which again is just a very uncommon thing to do. Like what, what, what are most 16, 17 year old boys up, you know, having fun partying and, you know, going out. So he was always tinkering away. So really just, you know, uh, a bit of an outlier and a genius when it comes to this stuff. And as soon as you know, he I can only imagine if I, if I tried to tear my hockey skates apart when I was in high school, I would have had to buy a new pair. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And, and he was getting creative because he didn't have much money. He was using whatever parts he could find. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing. But it all was in his parents' garage, which eventually, uh, when he moved to Calgary, was in his garage there. And his base, he was a basement, then built a garage specifically for it. And and that kind of there was a period from about you know 1994 when he really kind of started to make a go of it. You know, in his basement in his garage till I entered the picture in about 2004. He was looking for somebody. He'd gotten to that point where he needed help. Um, the quick backstory is obviously we're both from Winnipeg. I actually live right now about one mile from where the house he grew up in, in Winnipeg here. Uh, my dad coached him a little bit as a speed skater. My dad was a provincial coach here in Winnipeg. He coached Scott, so there was a bit of history. Um, but we didn't really know each other. We knew of each other, um, but we didn't have a very personal relationship yet. There were, was about 10 years of age difference between us. And I got recommended to him by a, a mutual friend. And that was in 2004. And um, we we're building out of his garage about, you know, a mile or two from the, the Calgary speed skating oval, which is this Mecca and this hub in the world where you don't just have Canadian skaters. You have American skaters coming to train here. You have internationals from 
you know, Korea, Japan, Europe, everywhere. So it's, it's really a center uh, that brings a lot of the best athletes through it. So it's the best place to be to, you know, access all the top skaters. So we were, yeah, two miles away and, you know, we, I'd go train in the morning and we'd be working away and Scott worked like a machine. Like he was in there every day of the week, almost 12 hours, like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., like 12 hour days. I remember eventually once he got married, his wife was like, okay, you're getting one, you got to take the Sunday off. Like he was just, he's just obsessed, like a, as a man on a mission. And it, it was incredible to see his work ethic and to have him as a mentor and, and, and work alongside him. Um, yeah, he just really fostered my knowledge. He's an incredibly smart individual. He's got a master's in biomechanics and, you know, he really would have been a doctor if he wasn't afraid of blood. Uh, so for the hockey world, I think we're, we're happy he cho he's afraid of blood. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so interesting to kind of hear the fact that his chronology from, I mean, that's pretty recent. Some of that, some of the, the, the ways you're, the timing you're talking about, mm -hmm. which is wild for the fact that, you know, kind of when I first time I started to hear, hear about, about, you know, Dustin Bufflin's wearing a speed skater, a speed skating boot. And you're like, what? And I it was, it was just so shocking. And then kind of like thinking about some of the things that I could give you some of the research that I've done with the speed skating, the fact that, you know, speed skating dates back to like the 13th century, um, you know, in Holland and, and hockey's only like 150 plus years old. And the thing that kind of blows me away and how it, it ended up kind of in buffs on buffs feet um, is that, that kind of similarity or I don't know how the skate technology over like the past 15 years and what you guys have integrated into a hockey skate and a hockey boot. Um, I'm kind of curious how the similarities, but also the major differences of the two. Yeah. And to give a little bit of like kind of the background on that going through, you know, the, the sixties and seventies, you know, uh, speed skates and hockey skates were actually like quite similar even going back further they were quite close like it was a leather boot it's basically like a, a boot that you would wear and you would have you know an aluminum or like steel blade mounted to the base of it using using rivets to to an actual boot like a walking boot um and then that sort of started to separate from mounting a blade to a boot to constructing a boot more specifically for the the sport of speed skating and uh, again, though, through the 70s, it was still just a lot of leathers uh, and very soft, not a lot of ankle support. And it was really even into the 80s like that. Late 80s, early 90s is when uh, composites started to come into play in speed skates. And that's where we saw fiberglasses getting introduced, you know, stiffening the skates. Uh, and then eventually the, in the 90s, those carbon fibers started getting very popular. Uh, so... You know, there was a number of different skate manufacturers, you know, experimenting and a few of which like Scott, who really, you know, took the bull by the horns there and learned how to, you know, make use carbon fiber to make customized skates by using foot molds. So, um, so that was really where, you know, he got entered into the business or entered into the market was using foot molding te te techniques. So you mold the foot, you pour it with plaster, you carve the plaster to recreate the foot shape. There's a lot of soft tissues, you know, in a foot. So if you see like in the palm of your hand, these would what we'd be calling soft tissue. But if you made a skate exactly of that shape, it would actually fit too big because the soft tissues would allow your foot to move inside. So you have to learn the anatomy of a foot and where you can carve away some of that excess material to make sure it fits really snug and then wrap basically start wrapping it with leathers and and carbon fiber um and that's when you know scott got into the hockey skate market we were i think it kind of was around 2006 so it was not too long after i joined with the speed skates that there was some interest to do a hockey skate and it was taking that knowledge of how we constructed full one piece speed skates which i can show well, i'll show you a speed skate boot here you can see this is the one that i raced in uh, it, it's full one piece carbon fiber. And this is molded to my foot. It's, it looks pretty rough. Try to make it as light as possible. And that carbon weave wraps all the way around over the toes. And it's that full one piece shell. So that makes it incredibly responsive. 
and just reacts to every little movement that I'm making. There's no twisting of it or distortion of it. So direct energy transfer. So that's what was key to go to going fast and getting the most out of every push. So taking that design and then applying it to creating a hockey shell, which would be one piece carbon fiber. So that, and then, that's you know, we went through a lot of evolutions of that. Like if you remember, we were called Ignite at one point and we sold to Mario Lemieux became the MLX skate. And that was really our first foray into, you know, kind of the public spotlight of hockey and making that, um, that skate, which ended up getting sold to Easton and becoming the Easton Mako skate line. And at that point, um, Easton didn't bring on, you know, the skate team, uh, consisting of Scott and myself. So that's when we kind of, it all parted ways there for that little bit. Uh, and we went back to speed skates over those years. So. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. Cause I was going to ask about that kind of evolution that switched from that. Cause I have just, you know, guys that play beer league and things like that, they were using the MLX skate and I'm like, you know, at first, when I first saw them that because they were so different, they had, you know, a lot more rivets and a lot more, a lot more, um, kind of hold on the on the toque of the skate um it was so surprising to me because i'm like is this another like t-blade situation where it's gonna sound like a like a like tin foil on the ice and everybody i talked to loved them and then because of that then i ended up moving to eat from graph to easton's and i was wearing the makos and then that was kind of my evolution into true skates um and then also just hearing so many great things from NHLers, you guys have got every every person that that every NHL or every pro that you guys have is really vocal about the technology of it. Which, you know, some of the counterparts in Bauer and CCM, they're the guys they sponsor don't talk about it. They just they're not talking about their their skate technology. But meanwhile, you know, Mitch Marner always ta- is doing a lot of things with you guys, and and I'm Tyler Tyler Bertuzzi is and. Bufflin, when he was in the league, um, had talked so many good things about it. Um, I was, I'm kind of, uh, b- based off that question, uh, based off that, I have a question about like, you know, true, true hockey skates and why you felt it necessary, why you and Scott felt it necessary to kind of change the hockey skate market from the world of Bauer and CCM. Yeah, I mean... It's an interesting, I know, I know whether we felt it necessary or something that we wanted to do, you know, saw an opening. We, I, I think what's interesting for us is we, we came at it from a very different perspective. Um, you know, we came from the sport of speed skating. Uh, the manufacturing process of our skates and speed skates was, you know, quite dramatically different. And we, we function on a business model that's purely custom. Like, every skate we make in a custom speed skate is one of a kind. And then you would look at, you know, the, the hockey industry and it's the way that skates are being manufactured by the other competitors was taking a pre-existing skate and then just trying to reshape it to somebody else's foot. And it says, well, that's, that's never going to be as good as starting from scratch, you know, and, and but we have patented as our built from the inside out, you know, skate making processes, taking your foot shape, your measurements, looking at the, you know, bone spurs, bunions, you know, you know, vicular bumps, Haglund's bumps, and accounting for those abnormalities and differences and width and length and all of this, and then building a skate to that shape, you know, right from the beginning, rather than try to take something else and repurpose it to fit you. So it really seemed like there was something missing in the market. Uh, that we could capitalize on and and it wasn't like you know just we did it and it, and, it, and it worked like we went through a lot of trials like in the early days we were working with Sergey Gonchar in Pittsburgh and we were making him uh, custom hockey skates but almost in a similar process to to our speed skates uh, and, and but it just wasn't you know we couldn't reproduce it. Uh, it it was very it was very very time consuming and then we kind of mastered a new technique of being able to bring that customization, bring it faster and more repeatable. And once we did that, then we got into the market. Because in speed skates, people don't realize some skaters will wear that skate for 10 years, 10 years. I'm not joking. You know, we, we try to say like, you know, two or three years, you should get a new pair. 
more because we need some return business, but <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, uh, you're like you, you can make the skates last. So in hockey, though, it's a different mentality, and I think the market is kind of built up. You know, and especially at the NHL level, they're recyclable, they're replaceable. Like you will have players, you'll hear like crazy stories of so and so went through thirty pairs that year. Now that's that's abnormal, but those stories you hear about, you know, like yeah. most players will go through four to eight pairs. And that's normal, right? Um, but it's this, you know, culture of, you know, uh, just demand and wanting to turn over a new product, right? So that's why in the start, it was like our process didn't quite work for that because, you know, our skates took time to break in. They had to get used to them. So we really had to improve on get your foot so you could get on that skate and within two days be feeling really good. Or now, you know, once you get comfortable with it immediately, like that no break in period, you get in our boots and you're good to go. So it's a it's a big learning curve getting in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so it's so funny because um it's funny to hear the fact that you're talking about this kind of evolution where I mean, you know, I'm 45. I still have guys I play beer league with that are like, you know, well, nothing's better nothing's better than my old CCM tax 752s or something, you know, like way back in the day. And I was kind of the same way. Like, you know, I got my first pair of like really good skates in high school. Um, I kind of built my way up through CCM for a while, got graphs. I was always kind of on this search for a good pair of skates. And then when I got to Easton, those were good. But then when the Easton Mako came through, it was a huge, a huge change. And then getting the, um, the true catalyst recently from you guys has been, because it's so funny because I'm always like, well, you know, it's always, I've been playing hockey long enough, a little changes, I'm not going to notice them. And the skate is like so much different than anything I've been on before. And it's so much, it's so much, it's so comfortable. It's so easy to get around my foot and it really holds my foot properly. And I'm kind of, there are guys that like to have a little room in their skate and I don't, I want it to be, I want it to touch every part of my foot. If I can possibly, if I can, if that makes any sense, but like, absolutely. Some, some guys just love that, that space. And I'm like, Nope, I don't like that at all. I want it to be, so tight it, it almost it's so close to, to hurting but mm -hmm. <laughs> of course you're you know and i've always skated in a very small skate but luckily because your guys is the way you guys build your boots my skates are incredibly comfortable you know unless i'm standing talking to a parent while i coach or something in them but that would happen with anything if i was in a in a pair of sneakers and i'm standing there standing still trying to explain how bobby you know just can't get kid just can't get goals or something i don't know so <laughs> Um, but it's been so good to like, see the difference and the evolution of, of the sport and how now, now people are like really plugged into the technology of it. Um, that goes for, for sticks, helmets, um, um, you know, all the equipment and everything. It's really changed things. And even in some, in some aspects, the ice has changed. I know the NHL switched the engineering of that. So, you know, I'm, I'm I, right now true has, a, such a good like duo of lineups because I know at first you guys kind of had one thing that was kind of the the basis. Now you have the catalyst and the hazardous lineup, and I mean, let's let's talk briefly about kind of the difference in those two and why you why you felt it was it was important to have two two different types of skate. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many different types of players, and there's people who have different strengths, right? And, you know, you see a lot of players that have incredible edge control. Uh, they have great you know, strength in their ankles. They can control their skates. They're looking more for that agility, mobility skate. So trying to get a little bit more flex, be able to move. They're, you know, they're working in the corners, you know, cutting back really tight. And then there's other players that are looking for something more supportive um, and stiffer. And both can be great players, just they, they need something different. And, you know, it, you know, I'm coaching a lot and I see those skaters all the time, you know, some, someone's maybe a little, just more of a power skater, really strong, but a little bit less mobility or, you know, a little bit weaker in the ankles and they need some more support. So we kind of see our hazardous as that support and stability line and that catalyst as that agility mobility. And we're in a, a really fun place because, you know, we we're still so young and new and we see all the ways that we can improve it and and see them start to you know 
divide and these these lines you know uh you know even split more and it's it's not even at entry level it's at the pro level too like we have a new catalyst gate coming out in 24 it's going to be every two years kind of the, the new model catalyst has just rotating every year but we got we all have pro nhl players in our in our 24 catalyst using a very soft shell but then you know you know, we go to another player like Mason McTavish and we give him the hazardous pro and he immediately is in love with it. Right. So there's these different players and they just have different wants and different needs. So there's, I think, you know, that really show there's a, there's a contrast in what players want and that's fine. So it's fun to have the two families and I'm really excited to see how they both evolve over the next few years. Um, obviously, you know, right. You know, when I go back, it's Thanksgiving here, when I go back to work tomorrow, uh, I'm working on 2026, you know, and, and working on 2027 skates right now. So it's fun for me to know what's coming down the pipeline and excited for it to get to the market. And I, I feel like we're always just waiting for the next year to get here. Cause you know, we going, we're going up against a hundred year old companies um, that have been around a long time. You know, they've, they've got a lot of history, but I think we got a lot of fresh ideas and we're just kind of getting started. So really excited about it. Well, and I think the, you know, the thing with the the older companies that you're talking about, you know, people kind of trust them just because their dads might have had them or grandfathers might have had them or something. But I think um, I think the fact that it's called true that you guys call the company true. I think, you know, I think the true trust thing is kind of becoming is a, is a growing um, thing for you guys. And I really, you know, I I I love I love the company. I'm happy that there is. A competitor to to kind of like ruffle the feathers of of the ones that seem to feel like they kind of have a, mono, a bit of a monopoly of of hockey and i i can't wait to see the growth of true um the one thing that i wanted to talk to you about outside of the the wonderful skates that i that uh you guys make was um i see in the videos for like certain retailers and such like that i see you testing and at first that question was going to be like, well, how much hockey is this guy playing? You know, he's a speed skater, but you told me your, your, your hockey memory, you definitely played hockey in your life. And I'm wondering as a, as a, as a coach now, as a father coaching two teams and, you know, seeing all and testing all this stuff, are you playing Are you playing any beer league or playing with the boys? Yeah. You no, I, right now I'm not. I, I, the, I did, I was like about two years ago now. Uh, and then now that I'm coaching, head coaching my son's team five days a week and my daughter three days a week, and I, I have them in speed skating. So I'm coaching that as well on top of it. <laughs> wow. So I, I'll rack up about 10 hours of skating. Um, and of course, so you're, with getting, my, you're getting plenty of ice. Yeah, I get lots of ice. I, I, I can't do the late nights anymore. You know, right. When you're our age, you get you get pushed to the 10 p.m., 11 p.m. <laughs> start. And I'm like, I just I can't. I'm too sleep sensitive. I need that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, totally, uh, totally agree. Yeah, a few years I'll be I'll be getting back into a league again. But I'm I'm already on the, the on the ice quite a bit. So uh, and I've been able to build a reputation as a as the skating coach in these parts for a lot of the hockey teams so whatever team my son's playing with i'll be out doing uh doing the skating sessions and lessons and uh so about there but unfortunately not playing as as much as i like uh myself that um that actually leads to something i was gonna add another thing i was gonna ask you about which knowing that you're a youth coach and you know you've been in at such a high level of speed skating and hockey and, and skating development and technology. Um, when you're dealing with kids that are a little younger and trying to see their skating techniques and skating issues, um, you know, does dad, does dad, you know, when it comes to that skill level, does dad have like, I have to, I have to, I have to slow down a little bit here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's certainly a change. You know, what's, what's fun with the kids is it's always, it's almost easier. Um, their habits quite aren't as established and their problems are more clear. Uh, you know, uh, I've been fortunate to coach, you know, speed's getting a high level, coach at a couple of world junior championships. And uh, obviously once you're an older athlete yourself, you, you're, you can identify what you need to do or maybe what others are doing wrong. And, 
but it becomes a little, you know, you're, you're looking at the fine details, you're getting the video camera out, you're breaking into slow-mo, you're, you're analyzing technique. And at, at the younger ages, it's, it's a lot more clear and, and it's a lot simpler and you can kind of focus on the basics. So, um, yeah, for sure. I could probably catch myself getting, you know, over analyzing, you know, a technical yeah. situation, but, uh, it's, uh, yeah. It, my my son, he probably gets the most of my feedback, so I drive him crazy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you've been a coach for so long, and I know, you know, I've also, I've, I've been a coach uh, on the hockey level for a while, and I know that over the years, you start to like, okay, you know when, you know when to say when, and you're, you also know when to like kind of back away a bit, because yeah. the kids, uh, the kids are going to be like, all right, coach, um, yeah. You're, you're coming at me too hard about this yeah exactly and, at, and at, at their ages right now it's like let's just go have some fun you know at the end of the day yeah. make sure we always finish it with a game or a scrimmage and something they enjoy and keep it light so yeah well tyler this has been a really good conversation um so happy i got to i i the the people don't know the listeners don't know that I've got luckily you you were able to open the door just because I got to meet your lovely family your brother your parents and, and even your fellow teammate and Denny um, for a while so it's been pretty great to uh, to see and communicate with Connor's amazing you know music and um, and also I I see Denny on social media from time to time but um, also just seeing how true is just blowing up and making really big changes. And when I talk to people at, at the rink, when players talk to me, when other coaches talk to me and they, they see my catalyst skates, they're like, what do you think about those? And I'm like, they're the best skate I've ever had. And um, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty picky. I've been through a lot of skates in my life. So um, I'm pretty happy. I got a pair of true, a true catalyst. Um, I'm pretty happy. We got to talk about kind of this evolution of speed skating to hockey and um i'm super pumped to to and thank you for letting me know that what i uh, might be coming in 2024 or 26 um mm -hmm. all the listeners if you're a true if you're a true fan if you're a true customer know that they flip it every year every other every two years catalyst and hazardous so um i wanted to focus on skating so we won't worry about the fact that you guys have amazing hockey sticks and other equipment yeah. as well. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm just the skate expert, so I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, yeah. and thank you very much for having me. It's it's great to have done this with you, and uh, you know, just love supporting our community, and you know, really appreciate you supporting us. So thank you for everything that you do. Uh, and yeah, it goes a long way. And you know, it's uh, like I said earlier, we're 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 the new kid on the block, but we just are really passionate about the game. Uh, and we just love it and, and we're so excited to be here and just excited to bring our ideas to life and give something else to the market and give you guys and our consumers options. There's more, you know, there's more out there and, and we're happy to bring it. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun for us. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Tyler. And uh, we will be in touch and I can't wait for the listeners to, to hear through this, this conversation we just had. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, that was that was a pretty great conversation with Tyler. Um, after I spoke with him, he sent me a brand new pair of skates. Um, I'll talk about those when I'm able to, um, because they're uh, they're a little under un, they're they're a little behind the radar of uh, of social media and conversation quite yet, um, but. Tyler also sent me these guys. I've got some great catalyst skates that I really enjoy. Um, the responsiveness of them and the comfort of them have been, uh, you know, second to none. Um, yes, I'm not an NHL player, but I skate enough that I can feel the difference. He also um, was super nice and sent me a, a, a true hat so I could, so I could beef up the, the true, uh, excitement a little bit. So uh, I hope you learned a lot hearing from him. I hope you um, heard about the kind of the evolution of him and, and Scott Van Horn, um, Scott Van Horn's movement from Ignite to 
to Easton or to um, Maryland Muse Company, MLX, to uh, to Easton, where they kind of stepped away for a moment. And then now it's all back to True. And these guys are making amazing skates. Um, they're making amazing products. I love their sticks. So it's uh, it's a real treat. It was a real treat to have a conversation with him. And um, maybe down the road, we'll have another one with him for sure. Um, something I really loved about what he was mentioning is that, you know, as a coach, he also, you know, he can overanalyze things because I'm sure that we all do that as coaches, um, especially um, I coach other people's kids. I don't coach mine because um, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have that extended family yet, but um, it is pretty interesting to hear how he kind of approached that and approaches these young players and seeing, you know, how he can help and adjust their skating and how it can help and adjust their game, which is pretty great. So um, I hope you realize that it was a lot of hockey, but it was a little bit of speed skating too. Don't worry, I'm not going to be one of those places that all of a sudden I'm saying how golf and hockey are connected because um, I really want to focus on the sport at hand. Um, all right, well, that's this episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you like. I hope you learned a lot. That's what I really constantly want my viewers to get. Um, the music this this week is an interesting one because usually I'm, I, I kind of meet um, bands or friends of mine that are that are talented, and these guys, um, I have a bit of a heavy metal. Um, I love a lot of music. I love all types of music, actually. But I do go to a lot of heavy metal shows. And this band, Insight, um, I'll put all their information below. Um, they opened up for Cannibal Corpse and Venom. Um, or Mayhem, sorry. And uh, here in Brooklyn. And then they went and had a couple sodas with me and my friend after. And they're really a great group of guys. Um, even though the music sounds sounds a bit aggressive they are really really good guys, good guys i hope a lot of this rock and punk and metal that i'm adding to the, every episode starts to kind of uh add to your playlist of how you uh maybe your pump up songs on the way to the rink maybe your pump up songs on the way to go see your team um beat, beat an opponent or something um so insight is a band from arizona they're currently in, on tour with Cannibal Corpse um, around the country. They are an awesome, awesome super metal kind of uh, kind of guys um, sitting in a van, having fun and laughing. So hope you enjoy. Um, don't forget to subscribe below. The subscribers are always kind of like, hey, let's let's uh, grow these numbers. Um, don't be afraid to comment um, if. I say something wrong, if someone in my video says something wrong, or you're also a, a very supportive of those things, whether I say it or my guests say it, throw something in the comment. If you love my show, throw something in the comment. Beef up my positivity, um, because it really does help to hear how people feel about my show. It really does help to make sure that when every week I'm pushing content forward, to uh, put that work in, so um, please uh, give me give me the digital social media high five. Um, follow my Instagram; um, it's brand new, so it's got slower lower numbers, but um, that's up to you guys. So we will talk soon. We've got we'll, we'll be in our second week of the NHL. We've got some fun things to to chat about. Um, in our next episode and I can't wait to throw that puck cross ice so you can rip it top cheddar. We'll talk next week. Day, day, day.